There we go. Okay. Pastor Ken Larson here with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. I constantly invite you on behalf of those who serve at Trinity Lutheran Church with me, I invite you to attend either in person or online our worship services at 8.30 and 10.30. The 8.30 is more traditional and this 10.30 uh, is more of uh, contemporary and music style and so forth. I also invite you to, to tune in with us and enjoy the Bible study. And if you have any questions, you can uh, you can email the, the congregation at trinitydelray.org. That's what we have before you, this question, who is Jesus? And it takes a long time to answer the question, who is Jesus? Because the Bible reveals a lot about him whom we call Savior. Savior. Jesus, true God and true man, what the Bible says about the word made flesh. Yesterday was the world celebration of the word made flesh to dwell among us. He put up his tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten son from the father, full of grace and truth. I said only begotten because that's how I memorized it long ago from the King James translation. We beheld his glory, says the Apostle John. Wow. But why? Why was Jesus, why was the Christ incarnate? Why did the Christ become flesh to dwell among us? We have looked at that. We have looked at that in more than one way. We have looked at the scriptures concerning the incarnation of Jesus and the reason for it. The Bible gives a reason, but sometimes we like stories. We like a story to illustrate. And long ago, in 1959, a man by the name of Louis Cassells published this story in the newspapers. Louis Cassells was the nationally syndicated writer, uh, and he received this story and did not know the source. Many people credit the story to the authorship of Louis Cassells, the United Press International religion writer. But he, in a discussion with the broadcaster Paul Harvey, said he and everyone else tried to find the source. And they said, well, maybe it's, we're not supposed to know the source. So why was it necessary for Jesus Christ to be true man? Well, here is that parable of the birds. How many of you have heard or read the parable of the birds? Starting back in 1960, Paul Harvey began broadcasting this. And on the Saturday before Christmas, he would tell that story of the birds. Hmm. That's what we have for you. Boy, when we're reaching back into a recording that was made in 1965, uh, the year after Jeannie and I were married. And I ask you to listen with all your attention. And then uh, on the other side, as they say in radio or television, on the other side, we'll, um, okay. we'll, um, we'll talk about it, all right? Okay. The man I'm talking about was not a Scrooge now. He was a kind, a decent, a mostly good man, generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men, but he just did not believe in all of that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just did not make sense, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He could not swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. 
He told his wife, I'm truly sorry to distress you, but I'm just not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay home, but that he would wait up for them. So he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Now, shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier. Then he went back to his fireside chair to get began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, and then another, then yet another. At first, he thought somebody must be throwing snowballs against the living room window. But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled out there miserably in the snow. They had been caught in the storm in a desperate search for shelter, they had tried to fly through his large landscape window. That was what had been making the sound. Well, he couldn't let those poor creatures just lie there and freeze. So he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter. All he would have to do is direct the birds into that shelter. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes, and he tramped through the deepening snow to the barn and he opened the doors wide, and inside the barn he turned on a light so the birds would know the way in. But the birds did not come in. So he figured that food would entice them. He went back into the house and fetched some breadcrumbs and sprinkled those on the snow, making a trail of breadcrumbs to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs. The birds just continued to flop around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He could not. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms, but instead they scattered in every direction, every direction except into the warm lighted barn. And that's when he realized that they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. To him, he reasoned, I'm a strange, terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Any move he made tended to frighten them and confuse them. Hmm. Just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. And he thought to himself, if only I could be a bird now, I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid, then I could show them the way to the safe, warm barn. But I would have to be one of them, wouldn't I? So they could see and hear and understand. <clears throat> At that moment, the church bells began to ring. The sound reached his ears. Above the sounds of the wind. And he stood there listening to the bells. Adeste Fidelis. Listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas. And he sank to his knees in the snow. Paul Harvey, I hope for you and those you love, this will be a wonderfully merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. How many of you heard that before? I never heard it. Never I heard it. Pastor, um, and I'm trying to think, where did I hear it? Uh, I, it had to be uh, David Jeremiah's uh, thing, but I don't recall that he, that that was where it was. But it didn't reference the fact that his family went to church. It, it, it didn't, it didn't reference that, but it, it was, 
the exact same thing um, where um, he, he put feed out to go into the barn and he tried and it was the exact same story and it affected me. And so does this one. You didn't play it last week, did you? No, I didn't. Oh, then I heard it this week. Bobby mentioned it briefly when we were getting ready to close, I think it was. And uh, I knew that I could get it easily. I have copy of the printed version. I listened in 1960s, late 60s, and I have it somewhere on a cassette tape. Huh. But it was on every Saturday and it started way back in, as I said, in 1959 and was published on that Christmas day. Hmm. And then Paul this, Harvey began yeah. telling the story in his inimitable way uh, every, hmm. I think almost every year. To be, to be uh, honest, this, this um, what I heard did not reference, reference Paul Harvey at all. So the story has been copied, uh, I would guess tens of thousands of times um, I used it one year as my Christmas Eve, uh, as part of my Christmas Eve sermon. Mm -hmm. And so the, the plagiarists, uh, in, 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 a, in a kind way of saying it, uh, have uh, used it to talk about the incarnation in a parable. Now, I want you to think back with me to the time when we were all studying the parables of Jesus. Rules of interpretation of a parable have to do with two or three things that keep in mind. One is that a parable is not a literal thing. It's not, a, it's usually not a story that actually happened, though some parables could have been based on or were a real event. When someone tells a parable, they do not mean for you to copy everything in the parable as having uh, an exact meaning in reality. For example, as I listened to this for probably the 50th time, um, I, I saw and heard some things that I hadn't seen before ever. Yeah. One of them was the light in the barn. And I thought, Jesus said, I am the light of the world when he put breadcrumbs on the snow. <laughs> Jesus said, what? I am the bread, of life. the bread of life. And I wondered if you found any other things in the parable beside the incarnation truth that the parable um, alludes to. Hmm. Um, speak uh, any other reactions to the parable. Well, I was going to say a, a lot a lot of people are very much like the birds. Um, we can do all kinds of things to try to lead them to Jesus as he was trying to lead them into the warm barn. But I guess getting on our knees and praying sometimes and letting the Holy Spirit do the work instead of us physically getting out there or doing all those things um, is much more effective. But listen to the words of the parable, but I would have to be one of them mm -hmm. and speak their language. Mm -hmm. The other thing too, I think if we know uh, you know, the parable in, in math, or not the parable, but the um, scripture in Matthew about do not worry. We know that God has taken care of the birds, regardless of uh, they're sitting and huddled together. I mean, they're huddling together on the branch, which helps to keep the warmth and, you know, and he's provided for them even in, in the uh, snow, uh, you know, pr prior to maybe even the man going out there, there are seeds or there's provisions that he provides for those little birds amazingly. So he cared for them as much as he could. And the, sure. the experience teaches him why. And for his way of thinking through, the reason for the incarnation is that 
God sent his son to be one of us mm -hmm. so that we could understand and yeah. come to faith in him. And relate. And relate, yes. Hmm. Anything else in the parable? I think the barn, if you want to press the parable beyond its intended limits, the barn is the kingdom of God. Yeah. The light. Mm -hmm. Right. The light is the light of the world, which is Jesus. And um, I don't know what else is in there. Um, if you listen to Adeste Bedalus, <laughs> um, come all ye faithful, and go and look up the words to it, you may find some incarnational language in there. Uh, true son of the father. The barn, the barn. The barn is represented basically at the birth of Christ, the manger and the lowliness you could, yeah. of the barn and the animals. I mean, no, that's where he, remember her, his daughter kept her pony in there. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to uh, 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 pull the reins in. Uh, first, we got to do this. Well, no, I'll just, we'll just do it by sharing. And we'll go back to the PowerPoint slide. Mm, I think it's that one. The parable of the birds. And if you like, I'll, I'll include it with a, I'll include it as a separate email mailing to you all. And then you can look at it again, if you like, or put it away. I love to save things like this. I, in the paper realm, I have a, a file folder called GEMS, G-E-M-S, you know, things that you consider valuable that you save. And uh, the file folder is pretty thick. So, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, once in a while I go back through it and I, I, I publish it for other people. So that's our thought on the parable. And now we come to some questions. I ask you, does the parable of the birds help you um, let's do it this way. Yeah, I, I don't, that'll work, but I still don't get all of you. Does the parable of the birds help you to understand why Jesus had to be true man? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes, it's a good parable. Mm -hmm. All right. right. Thank you, Bobby, for reminding us last week. Does it teach the whole truth of the incarnation? Well, there's a trigger word in there. The word yeah. whole is going to light light up your brain. It's part of the story, but not the not the whole story. Right, right, right. Well, can you can you expound a little more on how it makes us understand that Jesus had to be true man? I mean, I'm just asking for some All right. more Certainly. clarification, and then on to the next because. Well, I saw it differently. I saw it as, as Jesus coming into the, you know, inviting him into uh, belief. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was an invitation in there. Well, mm -hmm. the answer to this question, as, and I'll answer your question, Chris, in a moment. Does it teach the whole truth in the incarnation? Well, there's more to it, and so when you, when you read the parables of Jesus. One parable wouldn't tell you enough. So he taught many parables, yeah. some of which are recorded in the Gospels. And each of them has at least one central teaching that he intended by that parable. All right. So a parable is not a complete story, but it is a story to illustrate at least one point. Most of the time, one point. So here's another question for you. Think about this. In what ways is this parable incomplete in telling the story of the incarnation? In what ways does the parable not tell everything you need to know and believe about why Jesus became a human being like us? I'm not sure it tells anything, but everyone else thinks so. So I, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> well, remember in the parable, the central point of the parable is that he 
became man so that he could be one of us and uh, speak our language. He, yeah. he could relate to us. If the God was that is the true God was always distant, we would imagine what he was like. But as he told Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Right. Oh, that's really a wide open window yeah. to what God is like. God oh. is merciful and kind, and he is always eager to help, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. So when you see Jesus, you're, you're getting a revelation of God. Yeah. And so you do get information about God from the incarnation, from Jesus in the flesh, that you wouldn't get if Christ had not become man. But how is it incomplete, this parable? Of well, the parable just says we need to, you know, he needed to be like the birds in order to understand them. I mean, it doesn't say anything about the birth of Jesus Christ coming even as a child, as a as a normal baby comes uh, into the world. And then, of course, at the opposite spectrum of his life, it doesn't tell anything about the crucifixion, the resurrection, right. and uh, and the ascension and all. Uh, and then all the teachings in between. Right. Yes. And we say some of those in the creed. Correct. Who's KB? Carrie? Bobby, do you know who KB is? That's my, that's my sister above my head. KB's joining us. Karen Burtnett. My... Hi, thanks guys. Good morning. Good. Glad, glad to join you. We're in the middle of some questions about the incarnation of Jesus, and we had just uh, heard a parable. So if you're joining uh, now, just try to catch up with where we are. The parable is totally complete as a uh, story of why Jesus became a true man. And another question, finally, what must be added? And Judy, you set us off in the right direction by reciting some of the key events in the life of Jesus. You said he, the parable doesn't illustrate the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension. And it doesn't tell all the parables and how he healed and loved people and then taught the people. And that's, yeah, you know, he, those things fill the four gospels. Sure. And I mean, how he even grew up, up to his age of age 33 as a normal man. Right. He was about 30 when he began his ministry, says the Gospels. All right. Now that's really good because you guys are on the ball. So back to your question, Chris, why did he become true man? And one of the answers is in this Bible verse, and that is, he suffered and died in our stead. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, that is Jesus, Jesus himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus became man principally so that he could die for us. Oh, that isn't my question. I, I mean, that was not my question. I'm relating to the film and I thought the man uh, saw the light is the way what you know the kind of thing and and oh, okay. you can go all the other ways that's what I thought the film showed I misunderstood your question I'm sorry oh, you did, yes. so uh, so right. what is your question again and we'll we'll all work at it together no it wasn't a question I said my my I asked you to expound on it more of what you did oh yes I, it's done on the parable more, not why he yeah. had to become man. All right. right. Well, we did. We did expound yeah, we did. on the parable. To do that. But the thing is, I still think it was it was him being enlightened through the process of realizing the birds were, um, uh, ig I don't know, you know, couldn't see the light or, you know, right. that kind of thing. And then and his, he then realized that that was how he was acting. And he, yes. he decided to change that. Absolutely. You got it. You got it absolutely it right. There. So this is why uh, we look at the parable as teaching something about 
why Jesus became man. Yeah. Uh, to, you know, to relate to us. And so that he could die for us, as Hebrews 2.14 says. Would someone read the redemption from sin from Galatians 3.13? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Hmm. We, we studied that last time we were together. And I think, Chris, you asked a question about that last week as well. I don't remember. <laughs> don't remember. Well, a lot is going on. I understand that. Well, this is what he did for us. And he was considered a cursed of God because anyone who hung as he hung on that cross was considered by people to be cursed. the worst kind of criminal and cursed by God. And he suffered that humiliation as well as the physical aspects of the crucifixion. By the way, I must create an, I must create an error. I do that enough. I must correct an error that I made last week. I said to you that the Romans invented crucifixion. That's not true. Uh, 500 years before then, in the time of Darius, uh, they were crucifying in 517 BC. And one time they crucified over 3,000 prisoners for what it doesn't say. Uh, the Persians invented crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a most humiliating as well as a great and terrible, painful death. And it was done publicly so that everybody could see you better not get into trouble like these did because the same will happen to you. Mm -hmm. That's what our teachers did. They, the, a teacher would pick out the worst, not the worst, but one of the offenders in the class and punish that person. And we'd say, oh, you better not, better not do that. That's going to happen to you. <laughs> um, in, in, in another Bible study, we were studying Esther. Mm -hmm. And uh, this subject came up because of them. They... I don't know. It wasn't crucifying Haman. Is that his name? You know, or the Haman. Haman. You know, uh, but they hung him from a tall pole for everyone to see. And oh. and so we had a discussion about is that like crucifixion and stuff like that. And it that was the Persians. All right. It it could have been the same thing or a forerunner to that. Yeah. It would be hard to trace that unless you had a contemporary historian, uh, mm. not many of those around. Now let's go on to another verse that shows why Jesus needed to become true man. Another reader, please. First Peter 1, 18, 19, knowing that you were ransomed from your futile ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish, or spot. Now, this is similar to the idea that he became true man to die for us. But here we have two aspects that I've underlined to bring out uh, these things. And we did look at this passage last week. You were ransomed. Someone had to pay the price. And only a human being, only a man could pay that price. And what was the price? He had to shed his blood all the way back into the Old Testament with the Old Testament sacrifices, every one of them pointing to the Christ who would be the lamb. It would be a lamb without spot or blemish. Uh, Peter says in another place, uh, I mean, at the end of this verse, a precious lamb without spot or blemish. Well, what does that mean? What, is it, what does it mean about Jesus without blemish or spot? Without yes. sin. Without sin. Yeah. So his blood was precious. No other person could satisfy. No other man or woman, for that matter, could shed blood for our redemption because no other blood was pure. Born of the Virgin Mary, so that he did not inherit the sin of Adam. Got it? Right. It's a real, it requires us to 
take the whole Bible in our arms from Genesis to Revelation and get the whole Christ, not part of him. You can get part of him from Luke 23 and, and watch the crucifixion from um, what Luke has written. I'm about done with Luke 22, so I'm going to be getting this weekend to uh, reading about the crucifixion. Kind of a weird time of the year to do that. But that's where I am in my uh, reading of the Gospel of Luke, way beyond the Christmas story. So here is Romans 519. Read that for a reason we'll talk about. Romans 519. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Not only his passive obedience, but here his active obedience. He became, well, we're going to get to that passage, and I'm going to bring it up now. By one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So we were and have been and are declared righteous in the sight of God through the obedience of Jesus. It was by one man's disobedience that many were, and that word many is used in the large and collective sense, not meaning a few, mm. were made to be sinners. <clears throat> Original sin is there. All right. Now I put this passage in, I wasn't going to study this, but I realized that one of the reasons that Jesus became man was to fulfill this, this humbling, to be a humble servant. Please read uh, from Philippians 2, and somebody else, if you will. I will. Um, Philippine, Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped. Equality, I'm sorry, count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emphasized, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Hmm. This is the passage that sometimes is read on Good Friday. Hmm. He was incarnate to humble himself and serve obediently. Same passage, slightly abbreviated with my underlinings for emphasis. He emptied hmm. himself. He didn't count equality with God, the Father, which he had from the beginning, before the beginning of time, but emptied himself and did not always and, and in all ways use the power of divinity, which he had. Hmm. But he took the form of a servant. And he was born to be like us in every way, except without sin. And being found in human form, human form, he was a real man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. even the death of the cross. So God had laid out the plan of Jesus' life, complete from beginning, incarnation to end. And yet there was no end because <laughs> we celebrate the resurrection and the ascension as well. Do we have the reason that he became true man, at least better in our grasp now than we had before. You know, one of the reasons I am studying this with you is I'm aware that many studied this when they were 12, 13, 14 years old, and they memorized these passages and they stood up and, and back in those days answered questions in the front of the congregation of the Board of Elders, and they were confirmed made profession of their personal faith, and then they went on with their lives and forgot a lot of things about Jesus. That's the nature of those things that are not repeated. 
And that's why Luther preached on the catechism year after year after year after year. And he was patient with those little lambs in the congregation in Wittenberg, Germany. All right. He loved them and wanted them to know. So I also realized that many in the congregation and many of people who might be watching this later, they have the John 316, Jesus died for me, he rose again, and I believe in him. I believe he is my savior. And yes. they, they know certain things about Jesus. But the amount of learning, reading, education, uh, memory of Jesus as the gospels and the epistles teach and as the prophets prophesied, much of that is lost, is, is not, they're not familiar with it. So one of the reasons I'm working through this uh, many, many Bible passages about Jesus, true God and true man, is to fill in those gaps. And I'm doing it because I love you and I want the best for you as far as your faith is concerned and the understanding insofar as you have it intellectually and as the Holy Spirit gives you what should I say, confidence in your faith. Not only for you, but for those that might ask you a question. Always be ready to give an answer to those who ask you. First Peter 3.15. That's why Jesus became true man. You have any thoughts about this before we go on to the next section? Anyone at all? See, I see a couple of you are are muted, and that's okay for your own reasons. I was just thinking, you know, none of this would have ever had to take place if uh, so. original sin didn't take place back in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have had to go through all of this, but because of that, we need Jesus. Yes. Anyone else? I, I feel like through suffering and through the challenges in our lives, that's really where growth happens, right? I mean, it's it's not easy to grow when everything's um, when life is too easy for us. And I think maybe maybe that's why we have challenges because that's where we grow and that's where we reach out for Jesus. Yes, yes. I, I would like to study that concept with you sometime. I I have it in my list of eighteen or nineteen. A subject for future Bible studies, but uh, I haven't developed yet, but I'll, I'll I want to respond. It's Karen, isn't it? Yes, that's, I'm Karen, Karen Clembert net. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely, uh, and I, and I discuss it with my pastor friends that uh, if I have the faith of a 14 year old, I'm not putting down 14-year-olds now, okay? <laughs> Suppose I had the faith of a 14-year-old. I have the catechetical instruction that came to me over the past uh, year or two years, some people three years. I have uh, Sunday school, uh, eight, eight years maybe at least. And um, I know the story of Daniel and all those, you know, I've got that. Okay. But here I run off to college and there's times of testing and trial and temptation and I get married and there's more testing and trials and temptations and illness and death whoa mm -hmm. what does your faith mean to you now right I'm not going to develop that now but I absolutely believe in what you say that uh, an untested faith is is uh, well the bible is clear that he uses testing in order to develop our faith and show us how much we need him yeah well why was it necessary for jesus christ to be true god that was the other half of the question remember mm -hmm. <clears throat> well 
Well, the first one is to overcome death for us. Someone read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. I'll read 2 Timothy, verse 1, 10. It is Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Abolished death. Well, he did bring life to light through the gospel. Real life. As God meant it to be lived. And eternal life, which is a gift of God. But in, in immortality, which some people don't believe exists. I do. But wait a minute. Paul, when you wrote, he abolished death. By that time, you knew that you were going to die. You were in prison. Everyone dies. What do you mean he abolished death? <laughs> That's not, I, I, I'm being kind of. I'm pretending not to know the answer to the question. <laughs> How did he abolish death if we still have that everyone dies? Through eternal life with him up in heaven. Yeah, right. right. Second coming. Our death is, can I say temporary? Mm -hmm. Good thing. Yeah. He became... He is true God. Christ is true God to overcome death for us. Judy, we're back to you, I think. Okay, Mark 16, verse 6. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. That's he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul there in 1 Corinthians 15 is using a mm -hmm. euphemism for death. He has fallen. All those who have fallen asleep, he is the first fruits. What does that mean? Well, in a harvest, the people that go out when the first of the grain is ripe, that's called the first fruits. And they give it to God, by the way. I thought it was for us. No, God gets the first. And they paid their tithe out of the first fruits. Mm -hmm. So here, as far as those who are risen from the dead, not speaking of Elijah, <laughs> who did not die. Ask God about that when you get to heaven, if you like. I don't have an answer. But he has risen. Jesus has risen. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And he is proof that death is not the end. Now, some of you are going to say, well, Jesus is a special case. God raised him from the dead, as Peter says in his sermon. Well, <laughs> he has raised him to, from the dead to prove that there is life after death. He raised Lazarus, too. But then Lazarus died later on. We don't know when. He raised the little girl from death. But she had to die later on. Don't know when. But Jesus has not died again. He died once. Okay. He is true God to overcome death and the devil. Who's next? I'll do it. Hebrews 2.14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Yeah. He is victorious not only over death, but over the devil. Yeah. The devil put death on the world scene when he tempted Adam and Eve. But now he who had the power of death because of that has been subjected to the power of God. Destroyed. Insofar as he is unable to make this a, a penalty for all. 
I try not to say more than the passage says, but then my mind goes in a <laughs> in a longitudinal way, or, or and all the other passages that I know speak of the same thing. It's just the way that uh, biblical and theological education uh, builds us, and I think that's that's a good thing. We see the full thing. He gives us he gives us victory over death because he's God. Uh, man alone could not do that. First Corinthians fifteen fifty seven says what, please. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. He gives it to us. It, it's not something we earn. And it is a true victory. Though you don't, you don't notice it yet. Now, if you've been to a funeral in the last year, and that's probably not many of you except virtually, Joanne, you were. I know, I saw you on the live feed. Yes, I was there. Yes, you were there. And, and that was a testimony to the world that the, the, the one we lay to rest is, uh, has been given a victory over death through Jesus Christ and through his, uh, you know, I, I, I preach that to people so that they don't be afraid of death. Death is awful. I hate it, but it's not the end. All right, any reflections on that? Christ is true God. I better look at the time. Okay, we're at about 45. Um, the past week, I've also heard a, a number of these things, you know, in Psalm 23, um, valley of the shadow of death. Okay. I will not fear the valley and, and in, in response to death. Yes. You can stare it in the face and say, you will not beat me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not all Christians have that solid of a faith. They know it. But I think what you said earlier, Karen, is true, that when they see other Christians die, and how they die, especially when there's a long Ill illness, when they know that they're facing it in a most literal and personal way, not as a concept, but as this is me, I'm doing, I'm on my way. And then they face death with a different philosophical perspective, I will say. I can see it. I can see it. All right, now I'm going to have to decide whether or not to go on two natures in one person. We've talked about that mystery a little bit, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the next section that I'll start next week uh, has to do with what Jesus still does for us as far as his living presence in us, in our lives, influencing us through his word, being there to hear our prayers, and all of that. So I'm, it's, it's a larger section, and uh, because we have filled enough of the, of the hour that I wanted to do, then, uh, then I can bring us together and uh, and pray with you if you would like yes all right oh father we are most thankful when we see how much you accomplished when you sent your son your only son into the world to live and to obey to die and to rise to ascend and to promise to come again and to promise to be with us always, that we have a great legacy to pass on to our children and our grandchildren, our, all of the 
those who follow us by the way we live our lives, but also by our personal testimony that we have a savior who is Christ the Lord and we are immovable. Our faith is grounded in him. He is our foundation. Lord God, our faith is in your son, Jesus Christ. And we praise and thank you that you allow us to celebrate the birth that is unique and special and has this purpose that we might find life in Christ. Life abundantly, life that is victorious, victorious over death, and life that awaits his coming again in glory. And to him be glory, honor, and dominion, now and forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. And all of God's people said, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs>